So for today's topic, I kind of wanted to talk a bit about marketing career pathing. And the reason I wanted to do that is I've helped uh, four companies this year place a VP of marketing or a CMO, and I helped five companies last year. Uh, I thought I would be pretty good at doing that, and of the five I placed last year, three of them I got wrong. I was like, wow, how did I get those wrong? Like, what, what exactly kind of happened? Um, this year, I think we've got them all right. So hopefully, hopefully. We'll see about Justin. It's only a couple of weeks. Um, and I think why is, like, what does marketing even mean now is gotten more complicated than ever has. And if you ask some people, they talk about, like, the five Ps, and they'll say product and play. That's sort of irrelevant. Um, so it's just become this big mashup for a bunch of different stuff. And I think what a lot of people will say, they, CEOs, when they're getting ready to hire, heads of HR, when they're getting ready to hire, they don't even know exactly what they need. So they'll say, we need a CMO. And all they know is the sales team's complaining about leads. So they'll bring in somebody who can help with demand gen, but then quickly discover the real problem is messaging and positioning. Or then they might find that the real problem is how do you go about articulating the brand in, in the right way? How do you go about activating it in the marketplace? So I actually believe when you think about it, the VP of marketing today will fail by default, or anybody in marketing will fail by default unless you are a ruthless prioritizer and be incredibly clear about what it is that you can do, what you can't do, and you're very good at articulating the value and measuring um, of the work that you're doing. And then how do you build the team around you? I think it is, I sent out this kind of article, uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to peek at it, but I uh, sent it out yesterday on the seven personas of kind of the modern, modern market. But just to sort of hit those quickly, I didn't see an article like this out there, so I figured, well, I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> and uh, CMO.com picked it up, which is kind of cool. And I'd love your feedback on, on, on all of this as you sort of think through it. Soon I'm gonna invite uh, a few folks to come up uh, on a panel and sort of chat through this with me. But to set the stage, boy, I, I just, if you think about the job of a CFO, a CFO across a $10 million company, that job pretty much looks the same within, you know, 80%. It, it's pretty tight. Same thing for a head of revenue. A head of marketing can look very, very different across all these different companies, or it should look different. And it should really flow from what are the business objectives and what is it that you're trying to accomplish. So the seven different personas. So the reason I think that um, hiring is getting right, anytime there's a big problem, I think you just crack it into smaller pieces. So it's like, what are you trying to solve for? And so what we try to do is in these different um, uh, personas, get a CEO to describe what is it that you're looking for? What problem is it that you need to have solved? So the first one we talk about is a thought leader. And that's a person who can go into the market, speak, evangelize. They're probably spending two thirds of their time out on the road. Um, on my team at Exact Target, it was a guy named Jeff Roars. Um, it was Kyle Lacey, who's now at Lessonly, and his role. Now they have both evolved into new roles, which is really cool. They are now heads of marketing looking after other pieces, but their primary role was thought leadership, and it's an evangelism role. They might be writing books, they might be out speaking, they might be out. You need that kind of role when you're creating a new category or when you have a really commoditized product and nobody can tell the difference, then you need to get out and just tell the story over and over. The second one, and people talk about this a lot, is kind of the growth hacker, um, kind of the demand gen CMO. And I think there's no way that you can run from demand gen no matter what your role is. And my belief is you run toward metrics, not away from them. So I think everybody ought to have that as part of it. Um, and where's Mallory? Maui's hardcore metrics and numbers. And so like if you want to know marketing scorecard and demand gen, who else would consider themselves like demand gen junkies? There you go. Yeah. Yeah. The third one is there are not enough of these. And I think it's people who are really good at product marketing and demand gen are um, really, really valuable. If you're a marketer who knows deep technical product or you're a salesperson who knows deep tech, you're, you're in a really good place. Um, and this, unfortunately, is not something that's taught a whole lot. I think it is the biggest problem in scale-up companies is not demand gen. It's knowing who you are, what you stand for, and why you're different. And if you don't know that, then how can you articulate it to demand gen? And most of what you're doing is going to be wrong by default. So everything starts with messaging and positioning, and it has to go through product marketing. And I find it to be the most 
companies. The, the first thing I look at any company I go into is messaging and positioning and conversion rates. And you can immediately start to get a sense of, 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 uh, of what's happening. How many product marketers? I mean, we got at least one. Don, yes, yes. Um, we need more good product marketers for sure. Brand marketers, this one kind of, uh, people like me who came from CPG tend to be brand marketers uh, or start off that way. They kind of have sort of the big idea and it's about how do you go about articulating that in the marketplace? How do you go about sort of building a brand? It's ironically becoming, I think, just as important in B2B as B2C. And it's why you see everything moving to events right now because it's about creating experiences and one-on-one -on -one engagement. People buy products from other people, not other companies. And so this idea of kind of getting brand right um, the next one is the strategist. A great example of this is somebody named Sangram Barhe, who uh, is the CMO at Terminus. He came in at Terminus when they were at four people, saw the product and said, oh my gosh, what you guys are building is called account-based marketing. It's not an ad tool. If we did this, this, and this, we could shift it, and then we could change what this is in the product, and then we could create a whole movement called Flip My Funnel, and we could go and launch. And he basically, as the chief strategist for the company in some ways, as CMO, thought about what is it that we're really doing, and then how can we go about articulating it in the marketplace? The culture builder is kind of um, one of the next ones I talk about. Um, I think in the future, you're gonna see culture efforts in a company. They, I call this marketing from the inside out. You can't save your best marketing for just your customers uh, and prospects. If your employees don't believe, how are your customers and prospects ever gonna believe? So I think culture is gonna be shifting to the one, like the top three priorities for every marketing leader, and it will be led out of marketing instead of HR in the future. The last one, and if you're this one, um, come and see me afterwards. Uh, it's the all-around athlete, and it's whoever can do all of these at an equal level of competence and has spent time in all of them. It takes a lot of time. You have to have a lot of different experiences kind of rotating through them. Um, if you are that, you will be CMO of a public company, for sure, um, if that's what you want to do. There are not, uh, there's not many of those, but it's somebody who's deeply competent in at least four of those areas, and I think product marketing probably has to be one of those. Unfortunately, it's probably my weakest, but it's the one I spend the, the most time on refining my craft and trying to get sharper at messaging and positioning. So those are the personas. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And I think about why does that, why is that important, and why does it make sense, or hopefully makes sense? I think. If um, I, I value self-awareness as an attribute quite a lot, and I think we all have to make sure we're clear on which one of these we are and which one of these we're not, and be okay with which one of these we're not. Um, so for example, product marketing is my weakness, and the very first thing I did at Exact Target was hire a guy named Scott Roth, who was the best person I knew at product marketing, because I needed him to help do what I needed to do. Um, and then as I was building a team, you could literally go around, if you knew my team, it was somebody who basically made up each one of those personas. So the more you move into leadership, it's kind of about how do you bake the cake? How do you put together all the ingredients to have all of these working together? And then understanding which of these that you're good at today, and then which ones do you want to become good at? And if you want to become good at the different ones, how do you start to um, get exposure to the different areas. So if it's product marketing, you need to get more exposure to product and customers and being in the market. If you really need to work on uh, demand gen, you need to spend more time with the finance team and get more involved in the, in the spreadsheet and the metrics and the numbers. So um, it's about dissecting what is this role really of a VP of marketing or a CMO or any person within marketing. Understand which persona you are, which one you want to be, and how do you get there. So I um, had the privilege to kind of pull together some of the strongest leaders who represent some of these different personas at different sized companies across the city. Um, so we have Don, Allie, and Kirk, uh, who are gonna be coming up to join me. There we go. So Don's from Salesforce, Director of Customer Marketing. Allie is CMO at HC1. Sorry about your the fuzziness in the picture, Allie. You're a much more lovely in person. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Kirk from, from Lilly. So we've got a number of different disciplines and career paths represented here. And uh, excited to have you guys up. So come on up, please, if you join me. Thanks, guys. So I'll probably just ask a few questions, and if you guys can be thinking of questions as we go, that'd be great. And so sort of our game plan. So you, I always like to know, so like, where is this going? What are we doing? Uh, so we, yeah, okay, good, yeah, okay. Um, about my 
lack of pre-work? No. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, very good. So we will do um, uh, about a 30 minute panel. Um, we're, you know, I'll probably take 15, 20 minutes of that, ask questions, give you guys a chance to do that. And then want to make sure that you guys have a chance to kind of continue with the networking. My commitment is we do these, and we'll always make sure we wrap on time, no matter what. So we'll be wrapped by uh, you know 120, 125, so we can get you on your way and, and where you need to be. But we very much appreciate you engaging uh, in this discussion as we go. So the first question I have, and maybe I'll start with you, Ali, if okay. You've you've been at this for a while. How would you go about defining what marketing is? Today? I saw that question and was like, like don't ask me that. <laughs> Should I be philosophical? Should I be tactical? No. Um, so I, when I think of marketing, I instantly think of the buyer's journey. Can we do a quick show of hands for B2B versus B2C? That would be helpful. Mm -hmm. B2B and then B2C? Okay, cool. So most of my experience has been in B2B, and obviously buyer's journey applies to both, but that's really the lens that I'm looking through. And I think Marketing has more of an opportunity than ever to influence every aspect of the buyer's journey. How is someone thinking when they first come in? How do we educate them and nurture them and really position ourselves against our competitors? All the way to how do we get them to buy again from us and retain them and buy more? So that's when I saw that question, buyer's journey was kind of what lit up in my head. Um, but I see heads nodding, so I'm thinking some of you, yeah, familiar with buyer's journeys, yeah, thinking about your, your marketing that way too. Kurt, for your, you know, maybe you can give an overview of what your role is at Lilly and sort of how it fits in, which can give context, and then um, perhaps describe how you think about marketing or how uh, Lilly thinks about marketing there. Uh, yeah, no, that's good. Um, well, so my role is, uh, it's uh, senior, you know, senior director of integrated marketing, what we call multi-channel engagement, right? It's just something B2B folks may have heard that. Uh, it's basically marketing, but we had to give it a label and some energy and some focus to really transition uh, how we approach uh, the B2B side, right? So my background is really rooted in the product marketer side. Um, and, uh, you know, we, so, you know, you build your positioning, you build your messaging and your story, and then you tell everybody as often as you can, right? Um, but I think what we've realized, and maybe this connects to what is marketing today, is those fundamentals, I think, are still the fundamentals. I mean, it's about people, but uh, how you get there is very different, right? So we all expect much more of a relevant, personalized experience, right? So we're trying to transition from this product-centric messaging approach, right, to much more of a personalized and tailored approach. Um, so, and it's, you know, you've heard the references to turn in the Titanic, right? But I mean, you, you got a very large company with very ingrained marketing discipline, uh, some of which you want to retain, uh, some of which you deliberately want to change, right? And so it's um, it's a fair amount of effort. So we have a central group uh, that works with the brand teams and a, a new kind of revised marketing framework. And so we're, you know, kind of a Sherpas, if you will, to lead them through that and, uh, and also do some of the work. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's mostly back to uh, you know, trying to move that personalized, uh, you know, that personalized approach. And maybe last comment is even on the B2C side, right? So as we were talking earlier about just broadcast, you know, so Parma's, you know, started late, but then went pretty aggressively, right, at, uh, at broadcast. And you think about the cost there of, the, you know, the anonymity type of approach, right, or the spray and pray. And so we've definitely, uh, you know, are trying to turn on that as well and not just get, you know, your size of your commercials down from the affordability, but actually do it differently. How do you reach people other ways? Um, you know, so even social is now becoming a big part of that. And if you guys ever get the chance, we actually have a um, kind of a social um, uh, center over there now, which is really cool and it's pretty tech -y looking. So, <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. So, Don, for this one, and maybe you can help bridge us into the next one. I remember when you first joined our team a number of years ago, it was a big sort of career change for you at the time, yeah. and um, kind of came in and helped us become competent in social and all things social marketing, which kind of led uh, us to an acquisition of a company called CoTweet. And um, so maybe talk about how um, how you define marketing, and then how that ties to your own sort of 
career experiences and how you've moved your way through it? Totally. You know, I was thinking the same thing when I saw that question, like, oh man, how do I answer this? And I get an existential and think of like, marketing is everything. Um, and knew that if there was any salespeople in the room, they would like roll their eyes and be like, okay, sure. Um, I date a sales guy, so I know like uh, that, that they would uh, groan at that. But it is really, and it's the journey, messaging, is it's everything. It's the moment that a customer interacts with your website. It's a moment when a customer comes to an event and they have to wait 45 minutes in line. It's a moment when they attend a keynote and get inspired and leave energized from your events. It's a moment when they're with their sales rep renewing their contract. And what are the marketing moments that matter in that moment? And then it's even, you know, I love to be brought through like HR. If a company sees, or if a prospect sees a Salesforce employees helping clean up the circle and making it beautiful, that's a marketing moment. And the same thing if that prospect sees a Salesforce employee throwing their water bottle on the floor and maybe not picking it up and passing through, that's a marketing moment. And so how do we tie all of these together? And I think it's marketing's job to partner with all of those different functions to make sure that those marketing moments are happening and that the messaging is right, the positioning is right, uh, the touch point is right, the experience is right. So that's kind of how I see marketing today and evolving. And it's happened through a lot of the exact target experiences I've had. Um, what was nice about being on the coach read acquisition, you know, I think I, I would be curious if there's any social media marketers that have the most M&A experience than I do across IGO, Cardot, CoTweet, and then obviously the Salesforce acquisition and the social media marketing machine that goes behind that. Um, but getting to work with a, a startup like a CoTweet where you're building the website and writing on the website and doing the positioning, where you're at events speaking to our customers and talking about positioning, and you're also behind the scenes putting out the napkins and helping out with the event marketing part of it. Um, you get to really be a Swiss army knife in a, in a startup world. Um, a Salesforce world that's much different and it's swimming in your own swim lane and really becoming an expert in your area. So for me now, running customer marketing is learning about our product and then making our hero, our customers look like heroes and, and telling their stories because their stories are way better than me shouting from the rooftops about how Salesforce is so great. It's really their stories that make that, that marketing make a difference. So marketing is kind of everything. It is everything. It's so, <laughs> and so I'm curious for you guys, in terms of development and kind of marketing development to fit into all those things, what were the few moments that you had for marketing development or developing your career path? Was it you know, books? Was it a conference? Was it formal training that you know, Lily might offer? Or was it just learning on the job? How, how does that look, given how much, I, I, would, I would argue that the, the function has completely reinvented itself probably in the last decade. So training and development. Fit in. I think it's everything that you just mentioned, probably a mix of them. And I think just even some conversations having in the early networking, you said utility player. I think a lot of people here are wearing that hat where you're doing everything and that on the job training I think is completely invaluable. I think the other thing too that I'm trying to take to heart in nurturing others is giving marketers an opportunity to be with other marketers at things like this and at conferences and events. I think that's one of the things that Exact Target absolutely nailed in the early days. Someone coming in, I mean, I was like three months out of school and I was treated the same way that a VP of marketing was. Like, yeah, you can go to a conference and present on email marketing because half the people in the room, this is new to them too. So you know more than they do. Um, so we try to take that to heart in investing in our people too and giving them opportunities to go to conferences and be with other marketers and learn from them. Most of us are pretty social people as marketers and we like to learn from each other and hear from each other. So I think it's a combination of everything. Yeah. What do you think? Well, no, I agree. And we, we have very structured, I mean, I, can, I stopped counting the number of training hours at some point. Um, which was really good because it had a base, but I think to the point of there's nothing better than on-the-job training. Um, and these are great for me because I get totally a different experience from you guys than you know kind of a large company model. Uh, but for me in the career side, I think it was actually letting go of the framework a little bit and letting go of um, how folks said it should be done, right? Um, and Peter's here as well, somewhere back in there, who's, who's leading a big chunk of our work. But we had to, you know, we didn't start with executives saying, we need to change the way we're doing marketing. We started with a band of folks that kind of believed it should be different and just kept pushing, right? 
And so I think that was um, probably a moment when I just said, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna focus on what we think needs to be done uh, to, you know, start leading the industry and maybe acting like, you know, other industries, uh, rather than, you know, worrying about what the framework says I should be doing right now, right? And I think from a career standpoint, just maybe letting yourself go a bit, right? And pursuing what, what you believe as opposed to what's being Yeah, you know, I get asked the question a lot of, um, do I need my MBA? <laughs> and for me, exact target was my MBA. So the personas that Tim outlined, um, and he said he had a persona kind of that, that was key in each of those roles. If I look back at my career, I reported to every single one of those people um, at some point in my career. So that was my MBA. Um, so if you can find a company that allows you to um, not only be a great marketer, but find other opportunities and let you kind of expand and, and explore, um, is really key and, and maybe more valuable experience than anything you're going to get in the classroom at this point. And within your own role, maybe just to tag on to that, right? Yeah. Is like, you know, so, you know, I mean, you have your set job that you're doing at the time, but be always kind of working on the other skills as well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the things to maybe make it a little more personal for if, if marketing is everything, all of us have stubbed our toe at many times because you can't do all of these things. Um, when you reflect back kind of on career development and learning moments and how it all kind of ties together, Kirk, you mentioned something, I think that's right, which is we can all learn a lot from each other. I, I actually think the walls are going down so much between B2B and B2C. I'm calling it B2H, which is just business to human. I don't know what else to call it because I think we, people don't, like, at the end of the, you still don't buy a product from a giant, like when I buy Salesforce software, it's not from the building, it's from a person who <laughs> is selling it to you, right? Um, and there's no, like, sp if you're accountable for everything, which is kind of the way, it could be anything you wanted to do in some ways as a marketer, how do you go about kind of that discussion with your boss? If I look at CMO tenure today, our marketing tenureship, it's shorter than it's ever been. It's, it's the shortest tenure role in the C-suite. I think it's around two years now it's finally at, but other roles are at six to eight years, and I think that's because of prioritization. How have you guys managed the discussion uh, when you have an endless to-do list, as we all do, on um, what are the things that matter most, and how do you go about measuring it to make sure you're set up for success? Or what have you learned that you know hasn't worked? I think knowing what doesn't work is as good as what does work. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> some days I answer 10 emails and I come home and I was like, man, that was a great day. Um, and some days I'm with a customer um, doing a film shoot and that was a great day and I'm energized from that. Um, some days I answer 10 emails and don't feel successful. Um, I've seen a lot of salespeople that try to move over to marketing and they struggle because they need that number and that dashboard and that something to drive to. And marketing, we don't always have that. And, you know, we have like a higher arching company goal, but not always the day-to-day -day prioritization of like, make sure you do these five tasks. So for me, it's, and my team, it's lots of touch points and check-ins of like, hey, these are the five things I'm doing. Is this yes. right? Is this yep. not right? And like every day even doing that. Like if you need me for five minutes to talk through that, and for me as a leader to be at the bad cop and say to the people that are five below the line, hey, you, we can't do this. Or if you think this is important, what five of these top things are you knocking off? And go tell Simon Mulcahy, the CMO of Salesforce, why we're knocking off this key project. So I think um, daily check-ins on prioritization is like super helpful for us. Um, and knowing that sometimes telling an, a marketer, yeah, answering emails might be your top priority today. I think there are two things I'd add. I think what you just said, it's not only the five things that you're working on, but I think there needs to be crystal clear alignment. And I've fallen into this trap of here's the stuff we're not working on. And that that is where I have stubbed my toe before in not having alignment with other departments to say, it's not all of the above. It's this is what you get and this is what has to wait or you know we'll get to it later. So I think, that's part of it. And then what you said about like daily check-ins, things can change really quickly, especially in a small company. And in the matter of a few weeks, it may be completely appropriate to shift how we're thinking about what our core focus and projects are. And I think 
this like quarterly mentality, it's really nice to have, but it's completely unrealistic. Yeah. And so I think the need to be agile and feel like it's okay, hey, we set this goal of leads, but really where we need to spend our energy today is on helping nurture stuff through the funnel because it's coming in, but it's all really stuck. So instead of generating more of it, let's help play a bigger role in trying to get stuff to close. Like having those kinds of dial that kind of dialogue in real time, not waiting for the court quarter to expire is really important. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, obviously in a large company, you can have a lot of initiatives, right? And we joke that, you know, in fact, I had one of those meetings today, where I was, you know, it's like, oh, you're working on that? That's interesting, because that's related to what we're doing, right? So, uh, so it's a little different dynamic than maybe a small company, right? Um, so I think, uh, you know, prioritization is an interesting thing. To me, it's as much about kind of persistence as anything, because uh, there can be a lot of distractions. And so I think for us, as being, uh, maybe back to your point too, Ali, is being really clear on the mission and being aligned to that mission. And then as the new stuff starts coming in, you've got you know your, your kind of strategy and operating principles that you've got a yardstick to bounce that stuff up against, right? And say, okay, how does that get us to here? Okay, well, it really doesn't. All right, well then let's put that in the idea hopper for later, right? It's not going away, but it's not action on. Um, so that's a little bit of you know, how we're trying to operate is just you know, invest up front uh, as much as you can, right? And Any questions? If you guys have a question, raise your hand so I can get a sense of how much the audience. If y'all want to jump in, I'll quit asking questions. This is not a shy group, so, no, <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask one more question, and then I know you're going to bombard me with questions. Um, so when I think about these personas, um, which one do you feel like maybe you started off as? And then which one do you kind of feel like you're in today? And what what led to that kind of transition or progression? Was it something that you intentionally went after or the company pulled you in that way or a particular you know, uh, leader saw something within you and pulled that out and, and sort of expanded your? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so I would say I came in as a brand marketer. So um, my first role at Exact Target was digital marketing strategist, which was a catch-all for owning our blog or PPC strategy or website. Um, and um, that first day I came to Exact Target, and a lot of people know the story, is um, our head of marketing said, hey, I, I went to a marketing profs B2B conference last week, this Twitter thing's supposed to take off, who wants to do it? And being the first day and young, I raised my hand to run our Twitter account. And um, from there, it kind of grew as part of more and more of my role to Overnight, it changed from that brand marketing to the product marketer because we happened to acquire the social media company that I was using our uh, to manage our, our Twitter accounts and our Facebook accounts. Um, so literally overnight, I became one type of marketer to the next. Um, but I gathered those skills in beforehand to kind of be able to be that product marketer, and, and our leadership saw that in me. And um, and being able to talk to a product and go technical and go deep on the messaging and positioning. I was the only one in the company that knew the product at all. So of course I was the leader in the messaging and positioning. Um, and we went on a crazy road show from Seattle to the South by and um, meeting with customers in San Francisco. And it really changed my life overnight. Um, and now when I look back, I'm glad I had that marketing and branding experience because even in my role today and being so positioning and messaging focused with our customers, I can look on our website and be like, that's not right. Like we gotta switch this or move this or the content feels off or this feels too long or you know I'm able to get into the weeds on the our digital strategy of how it applies to customer marketing. I think so. I started at Exact Target in 2003 and worked for one of the co-founders, Chris Baggett, and um, I think it's relevant to share which persona Chris is. Um, he's clearly the thought leader and. I had the great benefit of getting to absorb a lot of that and seeing that happen. He was the guy who was at every event, whether it was like the local BMA or <laughs> you know national national conferences. He was there speaking, you know, creating a blog, creating content, writing the book, 
And so that clicked for me how valuable that part was. I've never personally played that role. I've been really lucky to have people around me who have played that role well. Um, so I've played more of the growth hacker role and the person like in the spreadsheet, I remember early days at Exact Target, it would be like, hey, guess what? 10 new sales reps just started and we need to feed all of them leads. Surprise, let's figure out the formula to make sure that that happens. And so I tend to go more ops focused. I think especially after um, having a business, some of you are familiar with Compendium, um, and being in more of an ops role there, sometimes I can almost go a little too narrow in the ops and have to kind of like pull myself out. I like to figure out why things are or aren't working, and I think that is a really important role, um, but I have, have had a lot of help in people who are better product marketers than I am, thought leaders than I am. I definitely lean more toward the growth and the brand side of things. Yeah, and for me, I think I mentioned a little bit, but I kind of came up through kind of the product marketing side, right? And there's some growth hacker in there as you know, we're trying to build a brand and be one of the Pfizer products and finally did. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then, you know, as, as this role kind of started to grow, it became more of the thought leader and, uh, and now it's actually probably as much around, you know, culture and that sort of thing, which is uh, a stretch, you know, especially at a company like Lilly where there's you know, so many pieces, so it's definitely stretching me. Uh, but I think it's been kind of a journey, but probably, you know, oriented in that product side. So I heard a couple things which are kind of cool, which is things can change very fast, mm -hmm. and when they do, get ready. I think yeah. compared to any other function, something, be it an acquisition, something that happens in an industry can change whatever you do very quickly. And so getting some broad competency across these that, you know, John, you were, it's what do they say, luck is the definition of preparation. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you were you were right there at the right time. And, the, and it kind of builds on the second one, which is expertise is relative. I mean, this, this whole, function is so new, I guarantee you everybody in this room can teach me something about marketing, even though I've been doing it 20 years, um, because it's just changing so fast. And um, you can become an expert. You know, we invest in a company called Terminus that does account-based marketing. That category of software did not even exist two years ago. Uh, and now I think they just signed up like their 400th customer. And so things can change so, so quickly. And I think marketing can really be at the forefront of leading that change and digesting that change for the company. And sort of, I actually think the role of a marketer in many ways is that of a change agent. It's absorbing what's happening in the market and being able to kind of help push that inside the company and your customers in a way that makes sense. And then I've also thought about it as kind of watch gears. When marketing works really well, there's product and sales, but if marketing is not the gear that's connecting the two together, you just have product all building cool stuff, selling, you know, out doing whatever they can, but marketing needs to exist to connect everything together. It's that kind of connective gear that should sit in the middle that really ties together uh, product, sales, customer success, everything together in one, and when it's missing, it is really, really noticeable. So sometimes I think about what is marketing not, marketing is not just demand gen, though that is an important part of marketing, and we should run from that, but I do I think it's the end-to-end -end customer experience. So, what questions do you guys have? Yes? I think, and I'm gonna go back, I used to work for Wes Antrus, and I remember he, I remember when I actually put my notice in to leave when I was working Oh, thanks for that. bringing that yeah. up. <laughs> 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 no, I remember you, you talking to me about how, you know, when you hire, you need to be spending a lot of time thinking about who am I hiring and how do they balance my own style. So going back to what you said, Tim, you know, when you're building a team, you need to diversify the skill set that you're hiring for. How do you, as kind of a new manager and marketing leader, a lot of times I find myself kind of putting that piece of it on the back burner when really that's so important when you're making hiring decisions to spend a ton of time thinking about what is the skill set of my team and what do I need to hire for? How do you make time for that today? And are there resources you're using? What advice do you have? I'm a huge fan, and not that you can like do this with every candidate, but I'm a huge fan of the Berkman assessment. Um, I actually just took it two weeks ago and literally came home from San Francisco and sat down with my boyfriend and was like, here are the things I need in our relationship <laughs> based on my Berkman assessment. But I also looked at it from my team's perspective, and there are four different quadrants. You know, One's a doer, go-getter. One is um, interpersonal skills, kind of more the salesy kind of guy. 
One's the thinker, introspective, um, creative person, and one's process, very process heavy. And when I looked at my team and where we rated, we were all, I had one person in at least every single quadrant. So that way we can bounce off each other of like, when we need something, a project that needs a little more process heavy, we rely on Nitty, you know, who loves processes. When we need someone who's a little more creative and thoughtful, um, we can rely on Justin. Or when we need someone who's really good with our sales team and interpersonal skills, we can rely on Amy to help us with that. Um, and so I think it's diversifying the skill set you have around you, not just even like, like more from a personality side. Um, I also like to ask folks in an interview, what Microsoft Office product are you? Um, are you a word person and you like to write long novels and talk about that? Are you Excel and you're a bro hacker and want to live in pivot tables, which like makes me hives? Are you, are you a PowerPoint person and you need two bullets and a picture and can talk to that and tell stories and be you know more product marketing? And based on those answers, that's where I see kind of where can I diversify across the team. I had kind of an oh crap moment because I had a meeting with Tim, this was last year, and he named maybe like seven or eight different uh, marketing tool sets that we should think about using. And I realized I had no idea what any of them were. So that feeling of like you can get out of out of date really quickly on marketing. It is always changing. There's always something new to learn. And that made me realize like I was starting to get, as a digital marketer, I was starting to get rusty on digital marketing. And so I brought somebody in who had agency experience, which has been an awesome way to have a generalist who knows a little bit about everything. So that's been like right off the bat, there was immediate value in her. I think um, other times hiring has been more like, what's the stuff that I'm getting bogged down in that is just not a good use of my time? Like, it needs to happen. We've got to keep the trains on the tracks, but maybe I'm doing way too much content writing, you know, on my own. Is that something we need to hire? Is it something we can contract and have made decisions more that way? Those are great. I'll just maybe add a little different wrinkle because um, we've, as we build this group, we hired a, a lot of people kind of a year, uh, about a year ago. And, about to do some more of that. We brought in folks from you know, Google and Amazon and Salesforce to you know, complement the mix, bring some new ideas. But I think um, the compliment, uh, complementary skills is great. But the one thing I'd say is, and even looking back, that maybe I could have done an, even a better job on is what is the consistent culture that we're trying to build, right? Because you want these skills to be complementary. If the people aren't complementary, then the skills don't get complementary, right? So I think maybe just to add to that a little bit is really making sure we're all thinking through kind of what is that culture element so that so that they do all then have some center of uh, commonality. You know, the, the red thread that kind of ties a lot of this together is um, self-awareness, because you guys all say that you know what you're good at and what you're not. And then the next one was intentionality. So because I have this gap, this is what we need to do. We need to go hire somebody in, in that direction. And I think that's that's a lot of, of what this is, just admitting that you're not all of these. These are the ones that I'm best at. This is how I need to sort of hire for now to kind of balance it out. But to, to do that, to state the obvious, you have to know where you fit in and sort of be honest about that. Another, another question? Yeah, Tim, you touched on it, the whole link between product marketing and marketing and yes. go to market, right? And yep. how to make anything in marketing, it is everything, so I'd love to hear your guys' experience about, and maybe times that it's worked and times that it's failed, making something actionable, right? Marketing is spending all this time, so how do we get people in the organization to use it or our clients to absorb it? And I know that's a big ask, but think about some things of like when we launch, it could be a product, it could be a new campaign, and what worked in making that actionable and what didn't work as you reflect on it. I'll kick that one off as they think for, um, in my career, half the time I've led product marketing and half the time not. And I actually think product marketing can live in different places at different times. So at times, um, it's which gear is outstripping the other one. So if your marketing team has gotten so advanced that it's way ahead of the product, then I think it can make sense to put product marketing kind of back within the product team to figure out like where, where are the gems here that we really need to pull out. Um, and then on the opposite side, once you're investing quite a lot in development, have all these like really cool things, but you're just not articulating to the market. You can kind of put it back in marketing. So I think there's some awareness of um, the ability to change and adapt and understand kind of where it fits um, when. And I think for me, there is no, 
us as marketers, and I'm definitely guilty, you can get into the buzzwords very quickly, and I think there, there's just no ex no substitute for being out with customers and understanding exactly what their problem is and what they're trying to do. And if you know the customers and you know the stories and you know the market, it just everything just it just brings immediate focus for me. And I don't I don't think product marketing can be done very well inside the building. Don, what do you? Yeah. You know, I, um, I think one of the biggest places where we've failed um, is Dreamforce to Connections. We just assumed marketers, once connections kind of faded away, that they would just come to Dreamforce because it's the big event. You would go. And marketers were like, no, like I can't network. I can't, you know, there's no orange swag anywhere. Like, where's all my <laughs> cool stuff? You know, where are my people? And um, it's too massive. And I loved the intimacy of connections. And so us as a product marketing team had to go back and say, okay, well, how do we message Dreamforce to marketers? Because there is places for them and there are places for you to do the networking and, and be um, and get marketing knowledge and expertise. Um, we just had to educate that market um, and also educate our internal Dreamforce team that this is not all CRM, this is not all sales people coming together. Like marketers need a place and we need to have space for them at Dreamforce. So from a positioning standpoint, that was one place where I felt like we failed. We didn't translate connections and the impact that it had to where it was at Dreamforce. And I think we have turned the tide on that, which is great. And if you're not doing anything November 6th and 9th, <laughs> 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 um, uh, I think where, um, and then I think from connections, just even thinking of that from a messaging standpoint, we, we hit it out of the park. I mean, we found like it was a feeling, a thing, a place, a color. Um, for marketers to come together, and so from a product marketing perspective, I think we really nailed it from a content and even our keynotes and, and messaging there. Um, we, connections is like the, the shiny star in my mind from an event perspective of where like we really nailed it from product marketing. I'm gonna go like even higher level. This is more brand side, but tied into product. So we have made the mistake, and I it's a mistake looking back in the moment. You always think you're on the right path, right? Um, but we tried for a long time to create a new category, which is incredibly difficult to do. We tried to create a category called healthcare relationship management. And at the time, so everyone knows what a CRM is, but healthcare has always been fairly behind. And so there wasn't a lot of general um, CRM awareness in healthcare. Salesforce, thank you, has changed all of that over the last couple of years. And so we had, just at the beginning of this year, kind of a aha moment of, now is the time to swim with the river, right? In healthcare relationship management, we can use that vernacular in certain ways, but when we are describing at the very highest level what our business does, we need to swim with the river because people are understanding and, and grasping that. But we spent a lot of time and energy and budget on healthcare relationship management, which if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have been spending that time on organic SEO for healthcare CRM, right? <laughs> I'd say it's 2020. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to say swim with the fishes. <laughs> uh, no, I think our example is just, uh, you know, we've built a really strong kind of marketing insights engine, you know, emotional based marketing insights driven through a lot of market research and that back to the customer part, right? But um, as that role, that, that in, those insights roll downstream to execution, I mean, they just weren't being applied, right? So I think part of what we've been trying to do is in our segmentation process downstream is you know bring together through data and analytics together with that attitudinal research not only the insights about why a customer does what they do but then who are they right so it's dr smith in omaha who fits that particular profile and then you can actually contour your story your messaging you know to those different so that was, that's that was a huge learning process you know we built this engine you know seven years right of insights but then it came to a screeching halt because it couldn't be applied to an actual individual so uh, that was one of the things we're now working on course correcting but yeah do you have like a set of personas that you focus on right so yeah it's in building those personas but then um, and I'm talking on the BB side right yeah. so we're but I mean so you guys might find this a bit odd but with a healthcare provider you actually have a really unique marketing opportunity that probably doesn't exist in most places, right? Because it's a B2B model. There's not a required consent ahead of time. You get all this data about their clinical practice and their prescribing behaviors and all those kind of things. Uh, you can actually tie it from the very end to the very end in terms
terms of marketing strategy, out through your messaging, their content consumption, how that affects their beliefs and behaviors, and you know, calculate ROIs in the whole nine yards. So I mean, it's it's, uh, but we were missing that piece in the middle around tying the uh, insights to the individual, and then also some stuff around you know tying their content consumption. But now, you know, filling those gaps, we're actually kind of having the thing. So anyway. But that was, uh, that was a huge learning. A lot of effort spent that didn't actually you know, produce anything. I want to be cognizant of everybody's time and also make sure we get wrapped up and out of here on time. So thank you guys all for being here. If you guys would join me in thanking uh, you.